Okay, so I am Glenn Jocker, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, Ultralytics, about YOLO V5, and most importantly, about the impact that we're having uh, throughout the world uh, for the positive. So at Ultralytics, our primary mission is to make AI easy. We've seen the potential that the technology has, and we believe in it, uh, in the power and the capacity to, to do good, to change lives, to improve the world. And we would like to show you a few use cases of that in practice today and uh, really give you guys an idea of what's going on at Ultralytics here behind the scenes and what our thought process is. So we started with a very simple question, and that is, if we take a look around the world as today, what would we change in it? What things would we change for the better? And these days, uh, there's a lot of options. The world has a lot of problems. So uh, first and foremost, uh, when we look at the world today, we see climate change as one of the foremost issues confronting uh, humanity as a species. And this has been slowly creeping up ever since the Industrial Revolution, which started in the UK. And now we're at the point where CO2 levels are at record highs. And every subsequent year seems to be the warmest year on record. So 2020, was the warmest year that's ever been recorded by scientists. Um, and every day, because of global warming, because of climate change, um, biospheres change and the species that exist in them can no longer survive. And so up to 200 species are going extinct every single day. So we think of, for example, when the dinosaurs went extinct, we think of that as an as event, like a, a point in time. And what's happening now seems slow to us, uh, but on a historical stage, it's all happening very fast. Uh, so we have an extinction level event happening around the planet due to human activity, due to global warming. So the modern society produces a lot of waste uh, and most recently, a lot of plastic waste. So plastic products are petroleum products and have become more and more popular in the last 50 years. Today, everybody uses plastic bags, plastic pens. And the unfortunate side effects of plastic is that when you throw it away, it does not degrade. It stays uh, for many millions of years. And what we see now is a lot of plastic accumulating in natural habitats like the oceans and uh, suffocating marine wildlife um, and simply harming the environment, again, due to human activity. Uh, not just this, but, uh, but the, the pollution in the air itself is uh, actually one of the leading causes of death around the world. Uh, in Los Angeles, where we have one of our offices, uh, we have very high air pollution and uh, worldwide, the statistic is that 25% of deaths are actually caused by air pollution. So on the health front, um, in first world countries like the United States, uh, we have excellent health care, but it's expensive and not everybody can afford it. Uh, in other countries where there's socialized health care, sometimes wait lists are long for operations. And of course, in even more parts of the world, there simply is no healthcare. In half of the world, people lack access to basic healthcare services, which is an alarming statistic. Uh, and 100 million people are pushed into poverty due to health expenses every year. Uh, so in places like the United States, you can accrue significant debt due to an operation, and the debt may be crippling to your life. So lack of healthcare resources uh, brings us over to hunger. So a lot of us think of going to get a bite to eat as something normal and every day. And in other parts of the world, that's simply not the case. Almost 10% of the people around the world are living in hunger and 2 billion people lack year-round access to adequate food. So a lot of the uh, niceties that we take for granted in today's world are not available to everybody in it. So this brings us to the fundamental issue, which is poverty and inequality. Uh, so almost three quarters of a billion people are living on less than $2 a day. And almost 40% of the people around the world have no formal education. Uh, so if I'd never gone to university myself, I probably wouldn't be here today designing AI models. And uh, you know, a significant part of the population simply starts off uh, disadvantaged because of lack of formal education. So some of these problems are new. Uh, some of them we've been facing throughout history, things like inequality, poverty, conflict. But something that is new that we haven't had access to before is the technology that we've been developing uh, over the last generation, which includes artificial intelligence. And this raises a very interesting question. And the question is, um, now that we're in a position uh, to start developing advanced AI models, what are the things that we could do with these? 
Uh, so AI models uh, are very flexible by definition. You can train them on any given input output pair. They will learn the relationship and then they will generalize in the future to be able to predict new inputs to outputs that they haven't seen. And so this is, this is very, very interesting. The way I see this is sort of uh, like a second industrial revolution, except instead of in the mechanical space, uh, it's in the intelligence space. This makes it much more powerful, uh, much more um, ill-defined though also, because there's so many different things that we could do here. So this brings us to YOLO V5. So I started uh, in particle physics several years ago using artificial intelligence. And this is what led me down the path to vision AI. When I started about three years ago in the vision AI space, uh, the YOLO architectures were the most interesting. And I picked up uh, with YOLO V3, which was developed by Joseph Redman and Ali Farhadi. Uh, so Joseph uh, worked on YOLO V3 uh, during his uh, PhD at Princeton, and he released the first three versions along with his academic advisor. They got so popular that he was invited to many TED Talks. At one of them, uh, a military officer pulled him aside and said, this is very interesting technology, and we'd love to use this uh, for drones on the battlefield. This raised a lot of red flags for Joseph, and uh, he decided later to recuse himself from the field so that his uh, work would not be used for bad purposes. Uh, his academic advisor uh, created a startup called Exnor, sold it to Apple. And at that point, the two original authors of YOLO uh, had split ways and both were no longer working on it. And so my main contribution when I arrived was to help port YOLO v3 from Joseph's Darknet framework. Darknet is an architecture that Redmond wrote in C++ and it's, uh, it's incredibly useful and it's very impressive. Uh, of course, writing a framework is not easy. It's even more complicated than designing an architecture. You have to design things like backpropagation routines, optimizers, and so on. And so the fact that he created that from scratch uh, is very, very impressive. But for other people, uh, perhaps C wasn't the best framework and the best language uh, to be able to replicate his work and carry on from there. So there's a very famous saying in science, uh, Newton came up with it. He said, if I've seen further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And so a very important tenet here is that you don't want to reinvent the wheel when you're designing something. You want to start from the work of those that have preceded you. Um, and so Joseph's work uh, was my starting point. So I, I picked up from there and I worked on porting that over to Python and PyTorch specifically. I looked at PyTorch and TensorFlow. I decided PyTorch was uh, a better framework for the future. It was more Pythonic, simpler to debug. And so my main contribution at that point was simply translating YOLO v3 into the PyTorch framework in, uh, in a usable sense. And once I uh, successfully translated this, I started working on improving it. And uh, at one point, I'd improved it sufficiently that I thought I should release a new version. The, uh, the architecture had changed, the training routines had changed, the loss function had changed. So it was a substantially different product. And I was working with two other scientists in the field, where it gets a little interesting. I was working with Alexi AB, GitHub handle, and Wang Kin Yu. Uh, who are in Taiwan. Uh, Alexi was in Moscow. I think now he's in Berlin. And we were bouncing around ideas back and forth. And we were both, uh, all three of us, developing our own architecture. So Alexi went on to launch YOLO v4. Uh, Wang Kin Yu went on to launch uh, CSP networks. And uh, afterwards, I baked both of those ideas into what I called YOLO v5, which has launched a little over two years ago. So, uh, Again, YOLO v5, the idea here is that we want to unleash the positive potential in AI. And I call it potential because I don't believe that we've realized uh, the, the, the potential in AI. It's got a lot of capabilities still left uh, to achieve. And uh, once we start unlocking those improvements, I think the use cases will expand and everyone will benefit. So at Ultralytics, our fundamental principle is that we believe in a smarter world and in a technology that is more sensitive to the problems around us. And we want to give it to everyone. The second part is very important. Uh, when I came to the AI scene, what I observed was that large institutions with significant resources really uh, dominated the headlines. And uh, while this is good, this is great that we want to sink effort into the research and the R&D on AI, we also want, uh, we want the little guy to be able to access it. We want the student, the high school student, uh, not just in the first world countries, but everywhere around the world, if they're interested in the technology, we want to put it within their reach. We want them to be able to train a small model, uh, just get results and sort of like have that light bulb go off in their head. Um, and if models take 
you know, thousands of GPUs to train and a team of researchers to achieve that next step. Uh, there's a little bit of disillusion, I think, in, in some of the population and the, the researchers that are interested in, in what they can contribute on a personal level. So we want this to be within reach of everybody. Uh, so since I launched it about two years ago, YOLO V5 has really gone on to be one of the most popular vision AIs in the world today, uh, which is really incredible because the use case is actually just kind of narrow. It's object detection. And we can see that right here. We're looking at our app. So after I wrote YOLO V5, I had an app. I created an app from Swift. I'm not sure how I did it because I never made an app before. Uh, and what we're seeing that is right here. So you can download this on the iOS store. Today, we have a new app called Ultralytics. If you have an Android device, you can also see our Android app. Uh, you can put this in the palm of your hand, paint it around the street outside of your house, your room, uh, take a look at your dog, and it'll identify all these cool objects around you. It's trained on 80 classes by default, but the idea is that you can customize this to anything that you want. So a few uh, practical use cases here. So environmental, social governance issues, uh, I think should be at the forefront for a lot of institutions. And these are topics, for example, like the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So what if we could detect cancer in real time? What if um, instead of going to an expensive doctor, what if you can use an app or what if a doctor could use an app as an extra tool in its belt? And so we've seen peer reviewed publications using YOLO V5 for cancer detection with significant accuracy. And this is something that's happening today. It's not led by us, but it's led by the community. So the plastic in the world's oceans that we discussed, um, there's a team called Deplastic. plastic They've trained YOLO V5 on plastic underwater specifically, and they've achieved tremendous results. The next step would be to embed this on a submersible with a robotic arm to actually begin scooping up trash from the ocean and begin to reverse the damage that we've caused. So forest fires, uh, these are significant. They're getting worse every year. Uh, so in Los Angeles, in California, we've had significant fires. Uh, in Portugal and Spain, here where we are, again, it's a significant, significant issue. Um, my family's from a small village up north, and we had a significant fire that came very close. It destroyed a lot of houses. And so this is a real problem that we're facing today. And it turns out the best way to solve this is to catch fires early, to catch the initial smoke and the initial fire before it starts to spread, before it gets large. Uh, so if we could set up automated systems with wide area cameras to do this, uh, we would be taking one step towards catching the problem before it expands, before it gets big, and before it becomes uncontainable. And this is exactly what research teams are doing with the OLA V5, not just for flame detection, which is what you see here, uh, but for actual smoke detection. And these are very wide area, or wide area systems that can capture 180 degrees out to, say, 50 kilometers. They look for trails of smoke, um, and they trigger near instantaneously once they see that. So the idea is to catch fires before they spread. And lastly, uh, we have businesses too. So of course, YOLO V5 uh, is suitable for for-profit institutions and purposes, not just for helping the world. So uh, we had a really interesting use case here. We had a Fortune 100 consumer goods company. You have their products in your house. They're worldwide. Uh, they did a POC with YOLO V5, which arrived at a $500 million cost savings uh, if they applied YOLO V5 based vision detectors company wide. The, the problem that they're solving is that they're manufacturing a lot of items. And every once in a while, one of the items has a flaw. So they have existing vision systems that'll throw it away. They'll remove it from the line. And every once in a while, there's a false positive there. So they throw away good products, which creates extra waste and costs the company lots of money. So the idea is with YOLO V5 systems, they can reduce the false positives and they can actually realize significant savings. And this is real money in the pocket of the institution. It's going back to shareholders. So this is uh, a tremendous impact uh, here in the business world. So we have uh, startups worldwide also using YOLO V5. We've got a company uh, based in the UK called Ballin.ai. And it's actually funded by Kevin De Bruyne, who's a player at Manchester City. Kevin is one of the uh, best players in the world, actually. And he created, uh, he wanted to create an app for kids to learn soccer. And what we have here is a screenshot uh, from the app. It's deployed already on the app store. People are buying it. And it uses YOLO V5 at the core to track the ball, track the players, uh, track shots on goal and their maneuvers and give them actionable insights to improve their game, to try and creep up to Kevin's level. So 
we have a, a French organization called SOIT, uh, which is active in Africa. And it is deploying YOLO v5 based low cost Android devices to 35,000 different farmers across the continent. This is helping them with crop yield estimation. Uh, so this is allowing the farmer to much more quickly get an idea of when he should harvest his crops and what his yield will be. And this helps him in negotiations with harvesting companies um, and is, uh, is just incredible. It's another example of how YOLO v5 is being deployed um, by organizations to, uh, to help farmers, to help disadvantaged communities. Of course, this isn't just for companies, uh, we're for helping solve global issues. This is just fun to do. So, so uh, we, we like making things simple. We love AI, we, we love it even more when it's really easy to use. And we saw something amazing the other day. We saw a kid training YOLO models um, and, uh, and, and actually getting them to work on toy cars. So we've got some other examples with uh, mass detection. A lot of people had a lot of stuff to do sitting around during the lockdown and a thousand other use cases, uh, which people are coming up with. So uh, to sum this up, uh, YOLO v5, by the numbers here, uh, we've got about 30, 31,000 stars, and uh, we have over 100,000 users per month coming to the repository, downloading it, and this adds up to a million visits. Um, so this is simply incredible. We started really from nothing, and uh, we built this up from the ground up, not just ourselves, but uh, hundreds and hundreds of contributors. So we have over 300 contributors um, on YOLO. And this is people that are coming, they're helping us improve the code. They're pointing out things that we've done wrong or could do better. And so if you'd like to contribute, uh, the door is wide open. We're rolled out the welcome mat to everybody. And uh, this is a team effort and uh, we need everybody's help. So the next step here is, is Ultralytics Hub. We've made things as easy as we can with YOLO v5. And I've always, uh, like internally here in the team, I've always said our goal is to, is to make things so easy that my mom could use YOLO. We're not there yet. Uh, since it's code, she doesn't know any code. We have a bit of a problem. And so we've created Ultralytics Hub, and this is a no-code solution. This means that even if you don't know any Python, any code at all, you can still train YOLO models and still deploy them into apps, into real-world solutions. This is really simple. There's only three steps. Uh, the first one is you, you upload some training data. So YOLO learns examples. And then it predicts on, on new images it hasn't seen before. So you upload example images that you want it to learn. You label areas uh, that you want to be identified as certain objects. So here we have a chickpea data set. So this is for farmers, for crop yield. So we label uh, the items in the images. Number two is you select a model to train. We've got five different models, nano, small, medium, large, and extra large. Small models are really good for deploying to low power devices. Large models are really good for accuracy. They can sit in the cloud. They're for people that are more concerned with their accuracy than with their speed. And then number three, this is the most important, and this is a big piece that's been missing from the puzzle in AI, I think, in a lot of solutions these days. This is deploying it to the real world. So uh, researchers are very happy just to play with one and two, but for us out in the real world, for companies, for people trying to change the world, trying to prove things, number three is crucial. And this is to take your AI model to put it in a place that's actually useful where it can begin producing value if you're a company or begin producing change. So we make this really easy. We have two apps, Android and iOS. You can see your model right in your hand and you can also export to a dozen different export formats. Uh, almost everyone that's conceivable, Onyx, TensorFlow, OpenVINO, CoreML, uh, even Paddle Paddle now and some others. So um, ultimately we wanna create an iterative approach here. You want to collect data, label your data, train, deploy to the world, and then identify edge cases, things where the model is not performing correctly, acquire more data, and then retrain. And so in a sense, this never ends. And this is just like, like us, when we wake up in the morning, we learn new things every day unintentionally. And this is how AI models should be also. A very good example of this in the world today is Tesla with their autopilot system and their deployed vehicle fleet. So uh, in closing, we believe that uh, the technology should be accessible to everybody. Everybody should play a part uh, in improving our world and creating the future. And that's what we're trying to do with the OLOB5. That's what we are, we are trying to do with our AI technologies. And that's what we'd like to inspire everybody listening here today also to do. We'd like to leave you finally with a question. And that is that what would you do if you could change your world? What would you pick to improve? And um, maybe we have something here that could help you do that.